Good evening and welcome to the Center for Missouri Studies, the State Historical Society of Missouri. Tonight's program will take us through the newest exhibition here at the Society, Missouri Women, Suffrage to Statecraft. The Society is looking forward to having uh, visitors stop by the gallery here in person at the Center for Missouri Studies to see this special exhibition, which commemorates the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which gave women in the United States the right to vote. The gallery is closed, however, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we will welcome back visitors as soon as we're allowed. Stay tuned for that. This exhibition is a collaboration between the State Historical Society and the Missouri Historic Costume and Textile Collection, which is at the University of Missouri. Contains clothing, art, and ephemera from the different eras that took women from suffrage to statecraft. This exhibition surveys the decades long struggle for women's suffrage uh, by highlighting the rules, <clears throat> the roles of Missouri women in the national suffrage movement, and also the trailblazing women here in Missouri politics who opened doors for others to participate in the democratic process. Timely subjects, kind of accidentally, disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement from voting, activism, all these things will play into our discussion tonight, I'm sure. Joining me will be Dr. Jean Parsons. She's a professor at the University of Missouri in the textile and apparel management department. She's also curator of the Missouri Historic Costume and Textile Collection. She's a recognized scholar in both design and history. Her research includes digital textile and apparel design and the history of the apparel industry. She is a fellow of the Costume Society of America, dying to join that, and has co-authored with Sarah McKetty, excuse me, Sarah McKetty, Knock It Off, a history of design piracy in US women's ready to wear apparel industry. Welcome, Jean. Thank you. Nicole Johnston also joins us. Nicole is the collections manager for the Missouri Historic Costume Textile Collection and is also serves as an instructor and advisor in the Department of Textile and Apparel Management here at the University of Missouri. Since 2012, she's taught history of Western dress and beginning in 2021, she'll also teach 19th and 20th century Western dress in her courses. Nicole's always looking for opportunities to bring objects into the classroom. Also joining us will be the Historical Society's Curator of Art, Dr. Joan Stack. She's a native Missourian. Joan Stack received her PhD in art history from Washington University in St. Louis. She spent five years as the curator of European and American art at the University of Missouri's Museum of Art and Archaeology before joining the SHSMO staff as curator of art collections. That was in 2006. Her research interests include George Caleb Bingham, Thomas Hart Benton, and the study of material culture's role in shaping historical memory, something that's becoming very important lately. Before we begin our discussion, uh, there's a short film we have that'll take you and give you an idea of what the exhibition looks like until you can get down here and see for yourself. This is a great video by Beth Pike.
As I mentioned, as soon as we're allowed, you'll be able to come in and see this for yourself. In the meantime, I am proud to be joined. I'm looking forward to being educated tonight by three very astute scholars. Nicole, Jean, can you talk a little bit about the collaboration with the art department here? It's been, the collaboration's been going on since before I arrived at the University of Missouri. Um, we have been doing exhibits every other year um, with the, society. Um, we usually try to open them during Women's History Month. Uh, so there does tend to be that um, leaning toward the exhibits. Um, Nicole? you. Um, yes, this is, I think, the fifth, maybe the fifth exhibit, joint exhibit that we've done with the society every other year for Women's History Month. Um, and it's it's quite fun to be able to join together these various uh, forms of material culture and these kinds of exhibits. And Joan, from the society's point of view, what do we gain? Well, of course, it's great to collaborate with other on-campus institutions. And I've always loved the way that clothing communicates all sorts of wonderful messages in artworks. And so to have artworks that, that relate to clothing examples of clothing actually together in the exhibit is something really exciting for me and I think it really brings the subject matter we're dealing with to life. It's a real example of the importance of material culture. Do you find that's true in your department when the exhibit's over that there's been a little bit of crossover appeal going on? Oh, yes. I mean, you can always tie it into whatever's happening today. It's often exciting in that way. We take it all the way up to the 20th, uh, the 21st century. And um, I'm sure that uh, that that was part of the one of the goals of the textile folks as well. We wanted to um, really show how relevant clothing is in communicating messages and how clothing it, artists use clothing to tell us things about the characters, the people, the, the different issues that they are representing. And these clothing messages were obvious at the time. They're something we sort of understand intuitively. Fashion has this kind of, um, I don't know, it's, uh, it, it has this magical quality for people. You just, uh, it's part of who we are. And sometimes those messages get lost over time. And so this is something that, um, that the clothing really shows. For example, just the colors, yellow and white. Well, those colors don't mean anything to most people in the 21st century, but they meant a lot back in the era of suffrage, days of women voting. So these are the sort of things we learn. And I think in this exhibit, uh, Kevin, the clothing's particularly important as it even is today for women in politics. It, it makes a statement and these, oh, yeah. these, and these women and the suffrage, the, the suffrage women were actually very careful about how they put themselves together because they didn't want clothing often to be the major statement that they were making. Let's, let's take a look through the exhibition. Uh, Nicole, you've got a few slides. This very first exhibit is something it's a dress from the late 1840s, 50s. The waspish waist, the cinched waist thing. Earlier today, uh, Mar Margot even showed a diagram of what that was doing to women internally, you know. Uh, part of the movement, of course, to get away from that kind of thing. But it's actually represented. In fact, you start with that. So that first dress is, is uh, the earliest piece we have in the exhibit. Um, and yes, women wore corsets. I think we need to make sure we're thinking about it in the context of the period because wearing a corset was, uh, it was a standard garment that women wore. Yes, there were uh, reform women who belonged to reform dress movements, but women began to wear corsets uh, as young girls. So it was a standard standard piece of dress. And the, the women behind you in the, in the other garments would also have had corsets on. They, they just don't seem as obvious, I guess, as that first really narrow waisted one. The other question I wanted to ask real quick was, for example, this first dress, is there a provenance to dresses like there is 
to some of the artwork? I mean, do you do you know who owned them? You know, I know you, you probably know who donated them. We do know the donor, of course, and and the wearer for that one. One of our oh. missions is to try to collect clothing that does have a story that goes with it, rather than just anonymous dress. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we do, not in all cases, but uh, in many cases we do, we can connect it to a designer or to a wearer. Most of this stuff is very functional. In fact, your whole collection, I, you know, it strikes me as being almost everyday wear a lot of the time. We have dress that covers, you know, in this period of time, women had clothing for different times of day. So it, it, a little bit, a little bit different than what we now have. Um, so we do have evening dresses, we have you know, dinner dresses, we have things from all different um, wearing occasions, shall we say. We had, uh, of course, we, now we have George Calabingham's artwork up. Joan, you've put up a print of... Uh, Verdict for the People. <laughs> which is uh, George Calabingham's part of his, uh, uh, one of his genre series was the electioneering process. Verdict of the People, might as well describe it, Joan. Well, you know, it, it, it reminds us of the whole institution of voting. And one of the interesting things when you look up at all of George Caleb Bingham's artworks relating to elections is they tell us a lot about what the whole process was like uh, during the, the uh, 19th century. And not only do you notice who is voting, but who is not voting. So women were not participants in the press when this particular uh, print was made in about 1857 was when the lithic was made but interestingly this this one does include women on the balcony holding up signs and this is the only one of the three election paintings that includes women in this way so they are interested in the political world they're beginning to have an interest to Participating campaigns to be important factors in the election process, but it's still very early on. It's after Seneca, it's after women have begun to ask to question whether or not they ought to have suffrage, but this is still pre Civil War. And after the Civil War, when women became so involved in all kinds of aspects of life, it was after that that the suffrage movement really got going. Up on the cold screen, we have an example of, of some of the 19th century where we're talking about. Uh, Nicole, you want to explicate this for us a little? Sure. We, we, we set up the exhibit in a, a time order. So it does begin in the 19th century. And as you progress through the exhibit, it goes into the 1900s and teens, into the 20s, and then into the later periods of statecraft. And what mm -hmm. we're looking at right now um, are two examples of clothing from the early 19 teens that we were influenced by photographs and this example of artwork from the State Historical Society. And you can see how we've cre recreated the woman's suiting ensemble that she has there holding the Votes for Women sign. Joan, do you wanna tell us a little bit about the artwork there? Yeah, this is one of the 19th century illustrations that we have in our illustration and cartoon collection, which is huge. Uh, we have close to 20,000 examples. And uh, this particular one came from the American Pup, which was a, a magazine that had humorous stories, lots of illustrations, lots of things, very popular in the 19th century, 20th century. The artist is Gordon Grant, who was an important uh, art illustrator at that period. You might associate him with uh, the Gibson girl style. Uh, that's kind of the, he did a lot of beautiful pen and ink work. And I think you see Now this particular image was, has two titles, which uh, one of them is Life's Great Decision. And the other one is which one? I believe it was published with which one, the words life great, life's great decision appears on the back of the cartoon or uh, illustration. And it so shows a college young woman who's graduated from college. And on one side you see the choice of participating in the suffrage movement, perhaps more independent life. And on the other side, 
the man offering her the ring, an engagement ring. So she's choosing between the possibility of going out in the world and becoming a, a more independent woman working for suffrage or getting married and settling down. And of course, this is from a male's point of view, so he doesn't suggest that maybe she could do both. <laughs> but mm -hmm. still, it's an interesting image. This is how um, a lot of people thought back then. This is from 1912. Women were just beginning to go in, to, um, to enter universities on a larger scale. Of course, I thought it was very appropriate for this campus. There were young women uh, on, the, on the University of Missouri campus. And this could be one of those women. So it's it's kind of an interesting image. And it's great that it matches up so closely with the clothing that you see illustrated here. We're still in the 19th century. George Caleb Bingham, Virginia Minor, Phoebe Cousins, Anna Clapp. All these were like great suffrage movement people. These were real movers and shakers. And the societies of Missouri has made a lot of difference. But uh, not a lot of progress was made until the turn of the century, it seemed like. And that's where we're heading with the exhibit, I think, right? 1900? Yes, there were um, women in Missouri kind of cooled their heels just a little bit um, at the turn of the century. And it wasn't really until 1910 when they started forming designated um, women's suffrage organizations that really kicked into, uh, kicked the movement into, into gear. Now, this picture you have up now, Nicole, is something that came up earlier with Margot. Uh, she was talking about the Maryville Women's Band. Tell us about them. This is a fascinating story. Yes, it's one of my favorites, too. Um, the image that you're looking at is the Maryville, the uh, Missouri Ladies Military Band from Maryville, and they were the only women, uh, women's band in the first women's suffrage parade in Washington, D.C. in uh, 1913. And the uniform we borrowed from the Nottoway County Historical Society in Maryville. That's one of the uniforms from the band. Uh, these are some more, uh, I'm gonna call this more illustrations up. These are illustrations from? Rose O'Neill. Rose O'Neill. Rose O'Neill is my favorite Missourian, my favorite female Missourian. And <laughs> she's included as both an artist and an example in this, uh, in this exhibition. Joan, before we talk about the cartoons, I'm sorry, give us a little background on Rose, would you, for those who don't know? She is the person who created the CUPE, and we have a local high school is the CUPEs, the Hickman CUPEs. So popular here in mid-Missouri, but incredibly important and popular as an entrepreneur, an illustrator, she did poetry, she did fine art, she did everything. But she became a rich woman when she came up with this idea of these strange kind of, um, oh, you might call them asexual little characters. It's hard to tell <laughs> whether they're male or female. And uh, they look kind of like little baby baby dolls. They have little wings on their backs. So they're related in part to the idea of the Cupid. And, uh, but there are these wonderful little characters and they lived in Cupyville. And she started out as a cartoon, an ongoing cartoon in a ladies magazine. But then she began to market them. And she made dolls, she made books, she made paper dolls, she made soft uh, Cupies. She did everything with this, a, a real kind of go-getter, a, mar a great marketing a genius. And um, she was also very interested in women's suffrage. Of course, she was living it, you know, as this very famous uh, entrepreneurial woman. She was encountering all kinds of sexism from the men who didn't think women ought to be doing those things. So she, um, so she became very active in the suffrage movement. She was also active in the dress reform movement. She wanted dress for women to be free, flowing, and but she um, she started using the QP or volunteering to let the QP be used to, to help promote uh, women's suffrage. And at the time, the QP was the hottest thing going. And so you start seeing these wonderful images. And on your left, I believe this is a, uh, a postcard that you could send out. Uh, back then in the day, and you see the little cupies are taking the poses from a famous painting that was painted in 1876 
and it represented heroes of the Revolutionary War. And so it was a, a revival of a, a centennial image. But in this case, the revolutionary figures are the Cupies holding up the yellow votes for women sign. So, um, so kind of a, a, an interesting uh, take on that famous painting. This other image of more Cupies holding up signs. And sometimes she would include her little poems. Our food, our health, our home, our schools, our play are all regulated by men's votes. Isn't it a funny thing when father cannot see why mother ought to have the vote or how they ought to be? So you often see these kinds of, um, they're, they're, they're done with good humor, but she's, um, she's pretty serious. And there was a lot, of, a lot of stuff about give mother the vote. There was an interesting appeal to men that shouldn't their mothers have the right to vote. They do so much for us in our lives. So an interesting um, example of the way- We have a question, women... Joan. Somebody wanted to know how to spell QP. It's K-U-P-I-E. <laughs> and uh, I might mention that Rose O'Neill uh, attracted my attention. She was like one of the most famous illustrators in the world and the highest paid in the world when she was in her mid-20s. Yeah. She married twice, badly, second husband, spent the QP money. So she moved back to Missouri and started a second career, lived and died here, born a lot like Benton's career in my book, left New York at the peak of her career and moved back to her home state of Missouri. Yeah. And we have a, somebody wanted me to respell Cupid, and it's not spelled like Cupid, it's K-E-W-P-I-E, -E, so spelled a little differently. And yeah, so her Missouri connection is that her, her parents had a homestead. They moved to near Branson, Missouri. And when Rose was ready to retire, she moved to that same homestead and, and lived out the last years of her life there. Uh, you can still visit the homestead. And in fact, I believe that the example in the show is borrowed from the Bonnie Brook historic site. Am I right, Nicole? You are correct. And so... Um, that I, I know that one thing we also wanted to promote about this exhibit is we have objects and artwork on loan from many, many different institutions around the state. Nicole, did you want to give us a little more information on that? Sure, the, the exhibit represents artwork, photographs, um, objects from 10, at least 10 different Missouri collections throughout the state. So we're, we're pretty excited for that. These, these strike me as, you know, so much of the women's movement was so well designed, programmed, planning. The planning was incredible behind some of the marches that I've looked into. And it goes right down to even stuff like this. And if they did do a publicity stunt with the Cupies where they put uh, votes for women's sashes on them and they had little yellow parachutes and they were all thrown out of an airplane. Really? Yeah. Yes, in 1914, yeah. I love Rose O'Neill. <laughs> we should be proud of her. Now, next is the, uh, this is a, something that we talked about earlier today with Margot McMillan, the Golden Lane. This is one of the most visible um, aspects of the, of the suffrage movement in Missouri. Uh, 3,000 women, over 3,000 women lined the street in St. Louis from the Delegates Hotel to the Coliseum where the uh, convention was taking place. And so you can see this is a snapshot of a delegate walking down the street and he asked to walk by these two, these two rows of women all dressed in white, wearing yellow sashes with votes for women and carrying yellow parasols. And they're just standing there in silence really to show how without the right to vote, women's voices are silenced. And so we provided some examples, kind of a recreation of the Golden Lane here and the image on your left. And some so of the- We have the exhibit set up so that you have to walk by a, a version of the walkless, talkless uh, protest to get into the exhibition. Wonderful demonstration, beautiful stuff. And Kevin, this whole use of silence continued in 1917 with the silent sentinels who stood outside of the, um, the White House in DC six days a week for an entire year in silent protest for women's suffrage. They had to get 3,000 people to St. Louis. They had to travel a lot. They needed to be more comfortable in their clothing and this, I mean, fashions were forced to adapt, no? 
Well, we do have some objects in the collection that represent um, some of the traveling that they did. One of their, at one point they decided that they needed to get out into the rural areas. And so that required travel by car, train, walking, uh, that, that Missouri is a rural state. So that they were, there, there was a need to get out beyond the cities and talk to women um, in, in smaller communities. I know we also have some, some clothing from that early period when women did have the vote and some, some interesting posters and signage and all kinds of fun stuff. I love the, uh, is it a poster that they gave to women for the, when they first voted in Missouri? It's, it's a pretty good sized sign. Were they giving those out? A window flyer. So once you vote, once you registered, you'd get a window flyer. Oh, you put, put it in, in your, your window. window. Like our, our voted stickers. <laughs> sort of, yeah, we wear our stickers that say I voted. They, but you have to remember that once the uh, amendment was passed, ratified, that the next thing that had to happen is they had to register all these women to vote and they were not given a lot of time to get registered for the first election. So you see these large groups, as you see in this image, um, of, of encouraging women to get out and register to vote. Mm -hmm. We talk about all of the women not having a voice, but we do have a section in the exhibit that demonstrates the, the group of people who were anti-suffrage, both men and women. There is there, there were people who just didn't think women should have the vote. So we do include some of that other voice in the exhibit. We spoke of the objects in the collection. Uh, the pen that we have from uh, Frederick uh, Gardner, what was it, 1919, he signed what? It was a Missouri bill to give women the right to vote in the presidential election. And we have the actual pen on display. So we're moving into like, the, the, the statecraft almost part of things. Uh, once they get the vote, they start to elect people here in Missouri, nationally, statewide. Want to tell us what we're looking at? This is uh, the second half of the statecraft portion of the exhibit. And so the image that we showed you before of the registration in St. Louis, that's, I kind of consider that to be um, a crossover moment because prior to this, prior to that period in 1920, many women couldn't hold political office because they couldn't vote. And by winning the right to vote, then they could proceed into um, campaigning for public office. And so the, the statecraft portion is kind of a survey of the trailblazing women um, from 1920 up to uh, 2019 who were in positions of uh, political office. Uh, Jean, Nicole, have you noticed anything, especially in the latter part of the 20th century, any kind of theme that runs through some of the successful women in politics and the way they dress or their philosophy of dress? Oh, absolutely. Are you trying to get across? <laughs> um, I, we've all read articles where the first thing that they talk about is what that woman politician is wearing. We, we see that all the time. So it, it is very carefully crafted. Um, to present a certain image. Nicole, were you gonna say something there? In fact- any, you, Nicole, any favorites? Um, well, I like them all, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but the black suit there, it belongs to Ann Covington during her time as uh, the first woman on the Missouri Supreme Court and their first female chief justice. And Is she- Ann also a board member here at uh, the State Historical Society, I believe. Yes, yes. I believe so. Um, but she talked about how she deliberately dressed in a manner that um, was similar to her male counterparts. So she wouldn't stand out. And so she would be able to um, not necessarily rock the boat that much. So you see very much a basic black suit. Uh, the other three here represented are? Jean Carnahan. On the right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Claire McCaskill in the center. Mm -hmm. And Vicki Hartzler there on the on the left. So you've got the basically the 70s, uh, the 90s, and first part of this century, and then the 21st century represented there. Mm -hmm. One thing I noticed about all three of these women is 
I think that television plays a role in the in the clothing they choose. So you'll often see monochrome clothing so that it's not going to look strange on the TV. You won't see as many much patterning and um, and all all three of these are kind of power suits <laughs> with a kind of a, a single color. But uh, I, you, always, you really that should explain the, um, the, is it a Korean outfit? Why, what that is? Because I think a lot of people will walk in and say, hey, what is that? <laughs> so that belonged to uh, Marianne McCollum, Columbia's first and only uh, female mayor. And she, initiated the sister city program with a city in Korea and they gave her this hand-painted hanbok uh, for that program that she initiated in 1991 and she wore that to the dinner in 1992. The very last object in the exhibit uh, from us is a painting by a member from the State Historical Society that she donated of the Women's March that was held in 2017. Am I right? Yes. <laughs> and uh, and then one of the hats that the women wore. And I don't know who the hat that you got. Did that come from some around here who went to that march? It came from a, a donor from Columbia, but uh, she did not wear it in the Washington D.C. march. There were marches right, all around the state. That brings it full circle, really, exhibition-wise. I hadn't noticed that. It starts with the Golden Lane, and it ends with the March on Washington uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, we have, I think, uh, a few questions. Uh, Kevin, before you get into those real quick, I'd like to point out I've shared my screen that shows the um, exhibit website. And it act our online version of the exhibit actually has more objects and images than what we were able to put in the physical exhibit. And there, there's just more content. It's a very rich exhibit. So um, we have it broken down in the same sections and time periods as the physical exhibit. So I encourage people to explore that if they want to learn some more. That's great. Beth, do we have any, uh, I can't get at questions here. Do we have any questions? Yes, hi everybody. Just jumping in here. I've been in the background. Um, I do have some questions I can go ahead and ask um, of our panelists. Um, Leslie asked, does Gordon Gibson, is that the artist? Gordon Grant, Gordon Grant. I used uh, uh, Charles Dana Gibson as an example because more people know that artist. But Gordon Grant was quite a popular artist of the same vein, primarily used um, a pen and ink technique, often had the pretty attractive women in his, in his imagery. Uh, but he worked for this Puck magazine, but he did illustrations for all kinds of different um, outlets and uh, publications. What are the highlighted boxes in the registration photo? We highlighted some of the women who had on clothing that was similar to the garment that we selected uh, to go with this image. And then the other boxes, you can see they're holding, there are several people holding that window registration flyer. That's what those boxes are. Who was fighting in Missouri for voting rights in the 1840s? So I mentioned some of the 19th century famous suffragists in Missouri were Virginia Minor, Phoebe Cousins, Anna Clapp. There's others mentioned. Oh, yes. <laughs> 1840s is early for Missouri. I, I 1840 is a little early uh, for Missouri, but um, at 1848 was the, the women's uh, Seneca Falls meeting, uh, which is sort of a beginning for some of it on the East Coast. A lot of the women's organizations in Missouri got started after the Civil War, I believe, is that? Yeah. Yeah, and, and we have that pre-Civil War image, the, the George Caleb Bingham, which just shows women becoming more active in the political sphere. Now they're still not voting, but they're holding up signs. They're, they're cheering uh, the winners of elections and the like. So you're starting to that, you wouldn't have seen that, you know, many years earlier. So they're, they're beginning to, you're beginning to see some hints that things are changing. But it also is an example of how it was before. 
I think somebody was wondering about the white, and white was a color that the 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 women wore. Um, it it both represented um, sort of purity in a way, but also it was a color that stood out at marches, so it made them stand out against all the dark suits and all the other dark colors that you would see around them. So that's why white was one of was considered a significant color. And Margo McMillan commented earlier that it's probable that the yellow came from the California suffrage movement, which printed their material on yellow paper. And since it was distributed widely, yellow was adopted as a color by other organizations across the country. And the yellow sashes really stood out against the white clothing. It was exciting. I believe the some of the clothing the from the um, current politicians, those are new acquisitions, am I correct, that for, the, um, for your collection. So that's, people are getting to see those for the first time. Yes. 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 I had the, the privilege of meeting a couple of the, the women myself and got to interview them a little bit. And that was a really, really wonderful experience for me. But yes, they're new acquisitions for us. So we're excited to have them. Before we leave, give you an opportunity some people may not be familiar with uh, your, the, with the Missouri Historic Costume and Textile Collection, uh, and it's part of uh, textiles and materials. Uh, textiles and apparel management. And apparel management. Just give a, a little bit of a history and where you're located on campus. Uh, we are in Stanley and Gwynn Halls. Um, we have a, a collection storage area in, in Gwynn, um, and some of it's also in Stanley on campus. We have a climate controlled, uh, state of the art uh, conservation uh, storage area for the collection. And our exhibit is in Gwynn Hall on the first floor of Gwynn Hall, our exhibit case. Our exhibit, the yeah. Exhibit, it's a, that's new, just a couple of years old. It's worth visiting to right across from our old location. I, I, one thing I want to say is that we, we do intend to reopen around, it will probably be in conjunction with the, when the University of Missouri uh, reopens and the uh, textile and apparel management folks have, I think, agreed to um, extend this exhibit. We, you know, we opened it on a Saturday and shut down on a Tuesday. So uh, people only had two days really to come and see it. So, uh, so we're extending this uh, through the fall. So you'll be able to see it uh, when we reopen during ne next semester. Cool, well, I, can't, I, I look forward to seeing all of you in person. My guests have been uh, Gene Parsons and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Nicole Johnston uh, and Dr. Joan Stack, who's our curator of art here at the State Historical Society of Missouri Center for Missouri Studies. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Joan, and thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you.